Okay. All right, so let's jump in. John chapter 4. I'm going to do my best to say something that's remotely coherent this morning. I've got a million different things running through my head and different directions to go this morning. So maybe, hopefully, something will make some sense here this morning. Because I, as I said last week, I love this story. I love this story. We started reading about the woman at the well, this iconic, classic story that we've heard so many times through the years, and I just love it. It's such a powerful message to us. Just to recap a little bit, maybe you're here and you're saying, I'm not really sure what this story is all about. Basically, John chapter 4 opens up with Jesus. Uh, He's in Judea to the south of Israel, and he's going to the north into Galilee, and um, the scriptures tell us that he had to go through Samaria, and that's a really important small little detail that you could go over quickly. We'll talk about that in a minute. It says he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus goes into Samaria. He goes to this well near a town called Sychar. And uh, he's setting at this well, and he sends the disciples into town to buy some food. And while Jesus is there by himself, this woman comes to him, the Samaritan woman, right? Comes to the well in the middle of the day at 12 o'clock when no one else usually comes to the well. She comes, and so it's just Jesus and this woman. And Jesus says, will you give me a drink? This woman looks at Jesus and says, how in the world can you possibly ask me for a drink? Right? During this time, it would have been unthinkable for a man, period, to talk to a woman in public like this. Um, many of the, the old rabbis would write that it wasn't wise for a man to even talk to his wife too much, especially in public. I'm not saying that's good advice. I'm just saying that's what they said. Um, so for Jesus to, to talk to this woman at all was just unbelievably miraculous. Um, second of all, she's a Samaritan who the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along because of, of their history uh, in, together in that country. So Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. So Jesus is crossing all kinds of lines here. He's crossing um, race lines, gender lines, cultural lines, all of these things, and says, will you give me a drink? And the woman says, I can't believe you're even talking to me. And Jesus follows this up by saying, listen, if you only knew the gift of God and knew who it was that was asking, you'd have asked me for a drink. And I would have given you living water. I'd have given you living water. Jesus goes on to talk about this water that uh, will quench her thirst. She will never be thirsty again. She misunderstands and thinks Jesus is talking about literal physical water. And she's like, well, how can this be? You know, um, Are you saying you have water that's greater than this, the water that comes from this well, our father Jacob's well? And Jesus says, oh, yeah. My water is way, way greater than this could ever be. Why? Because you're going to drink this water and you're going to get thirsty again. But the water that I have for you, you will never thirst. The woman says, well, give me this water. I want it. I want it. Jesus says, well, go get your husband. Right? He seems to change the subject on her. He's talking about all this this living water. And now he says, well, go get your husband. The lady says, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're right. You don't. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're with now isn't your husband. Okay? So this woman um, is, is a outcast, even amongst her own people. That's why she's there at the well at 12 o'clock in the day. She doesn't want to be around other people. She is, feels great shame in what she's involved with. She takes great abuse. She is looked down upon because of this. This was not out of line with what, where Jesus was going with the living water. In fact, it was right in line. Jesus is talking about this living water, and then he brings up the biggest area of thirst for her. Okay, This area of, when Jesus talks about thirst, what he's talking about is, is this fulfillment that we get the satisfaction that we get. And Jesus says, you've been looking for satisfaction and fulfillment in all of these men, and they will never satisfy. You will always be left thirsty. Only the water that I give you will satisfy you. Okay? She quickly changes the subject, seemingly changes the subject, and says, well, let's not talk about me. Let's not talk about me personally. Let's talk about worship. Let's talk about worship. And we talked about this last week, that we all experience this, right? Whenever you start to talk to someone about Jesus in their personal life, many times they'll jump right to a theological question. I shared the story last week about the woman said, you're a pastor, let me ask you this question. And she asked, were, were there dinosaurs? Right? She didn't want to talk about personal stuff. People don't want you to go deep and talk about their true thirst, what's really inside of their heart. All right? So Jesus doesn't get deterred from this. He carries on with the conversation and he says, all right, we'll talk about worship. He says, see, you Samaritans think you worship on this mountain. The Jews say it's here. There's coming a time where it won't matter where you worship. Father, the Father is looking for people who will worship in spirit and in truth. See, there's going to be something inside of you. There's worship that takes place inside of you that doesn't matter where you are. Okay? This is Jesus' whole point all along. 
when I said that Jesus had to go through Samaria, why did he have to go through Samaria? He had a divine appointment with this woman. He came to seek and to save. He came to, to find those that were lost and have them worship God. Okay? So she says, okay, look, I know, I know what you're saying is true, and the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to clear all this up for us. And Jesus says, I am he. And that's how the story ended last week. Okay, and we talked about how unbelievably important this story is for us. The fact that this woman um, was trying to find fulfillment in men. That was where she was trying to quench her thirst, and she couldn't. Okay? We have the same things. So many times we try to quench our thirst in something else. We try to find satisfaction and fulfillment in something other than Christ. Right? For some of us, maybe it's in relationships. Maybe it's through our, our health, being physically fit. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's your job. Or maybe it's the approval of other people. There are things that we begin to try to, to quench that deep longing that we have for satisfaction and fulfillment. And we try to find it in things that will never, ever satisfy. Okay? And we said only Jesus will satisfy us. If we're going to pick up the story in uh, verse 27. And I think what we'll do is we'll read, we'll read the whole part of the story here, and then we'll go back and talk about it a little bit. All right, starting with verse 27. It says, Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Because could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. And, and some of this is going to get a little compl complicated and maybe a little difficult to understand, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but don't get lost in these details, okay? Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. All right, so a lot going on in this story. All right, so Jesus has this conversation with this woman at the well, and it says, at that time, just then, at this point, the disciples come back, all right, and find Jesus talking with this woman. Now, something that I originally didn't think I'd get into, but I want to talk about this for just a second. The first two words in verse 27 are, are really huge for us to understand. It says, just then. Just then. All right, these are words that John doesn't use just simply to move the story along. He's intentional with these words. When he says, just then, at this point, is what the New American Standard says, at this point, this very particular point, the disciples come back. Now, why is that important? Why am I stressing that? None of this is accidental. Nothing in this story is accidental. When John says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, he wasn't saying it like geographically he had to go through. He was saying, no, no, no. He was driven to go. He had to go here. He had a divine appointment to be here with this woman. Everything that happens is intentional. It's not by chance. This isn't a by chance conversation that Jesus has with this woman at the well. Okay? It didn't just happen. He didn't just, man, wasn't it lucky they ran into this woman? No, 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 no. He had an appointment with this woman. The disciples don't just happen to come back at just this right time. This was a divinely appointed time for them to come back. Stop and think about it. What if they come back a little bit earlier? Does the conversation happen? They come back earlier. They interrupt the conversation. Jesus' intention for being there completely gets wrecked, right? What if they came back later? Maybe the woman leaves, and they never find out what the story was. 
They came back at just the right time. Why? Because it was divinely orchestrated that way. Why is that important for us? Nothing in your life is by chance. Do you think it's an accident that you're here today? Do you think it's an accident you're sitting next to the person you're sitting next to? Can I tell you, you had a divine appointment this morning to come here and sit exactly where you're sitting, to sit by the person you were sitting with. We don't run into people just by accident. We'll say that, man, wasn't that lucky that we ran into each other? No, no, it wasn't luck. It was divinely orchestrated. You are where you are because God has put you there. Okay, this is Acts chapter 17, verse 26. God has placed you in a certain point in time in history for a certain job. Okay, we have to get that. It's not by accident that you're in the family that you're in. It's not an accident you have the friends that you have. It's not an accident you live in the neighborhood you live in. It's not going to be an accident who you run into when you leave this place. There's a point in it. There's a purpose in it. The question is, are you going to take advantage of it? Are you going to have the, the, the courage, the wisdom to act and move according to what God has already appointed. You with me? That is, that is so unbelievably important to know this is not an accident. God has a plan. He's got a plan for you, each and every one of us, okay? So it says, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? I love that. They don't ask the question, but John says these questions specifically. Why? Because this is what they're thinking, right? They come in, and they're thinking, they're looking at this woman, and they say, what do you, what do you want? Are you, why are you bothering him? Don't you know who you are? They're looking at Jesus, and they're saying, why are you talking with her? Do you know who she is? Why are you wasting your time? But they don't say anything. Why? I read some commentators this week that seem to believe that they didn't say anything because they had this great respect for Jesus. Jesus knows what he's doing. I'm not going to say anything. I don't think that's really the case because they blurred out some stupid stuff later, right? I think it was something special about this situation. I heard Matt, Pastor Matt Chandler was talking about this week, um, a message that I listened to, and he was saying, um, you don't touch the deepest place in a person without there being emotion, Right? Can you, are you picturing the situation of Jesus talking with this woman? He has just touched her deepest longing, her deepest shame, her deepest hurt. Surely there was a response to this, right? The disciples, I believe, came back and saw, hold on, something is going on. Something has happened, right? That's why the timing is so important. They come back and something here has happened. It resonates enough with them to say, Something's happened, and I'm not saying what's in my mind. Okay? So then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? Okay, now, this message is usually an evangelistic message. What is evangelism? Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with people. All right? This passage is, is always taught in that context, or typically taught in that context. And I believe it's the right one. This is about evangelism. This is about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing what God has done for you, okay? But there's something that I want to make sure that we get before we jump into that. We're going to talk about a few ways to share the gospel. I made the comment last week, I heard Pastor Tim Keller say this, that the Bible very rarely tells you what to do and most often tells you the kind of person to be, which means we've got to work this stuff out. Right? And what the Bible says, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible doesn't give us this nice, clean, tidy list. This is what you do, and this is how you do it. Right? We may want that. We may want to look at a passage of Scripture and, and wish that God said, this is how you evangelize. You do this, and you say this, and you say this, and you say this. It doesn't do that. But we are going to get some principles in here that we can use when we share the gospel with people. But there's something that's so unbelievably important before we jump into that. Right? And, and, and it's this. How many people know you cannot give away what you do not have? You cannot give away what you do not have. I don't care what you're talking about. All right? So when we begin to talk about Jesus, that we want to give Jesus to other people, to use sort of the, the, the metaphor that Jesus is using, when we go to give people a drink of water, of living water, we have to have that living water first. That makes sense? It's something we have to have in order to give it away. Why is it that we do not share the gospel with people as much as we should? First of all, how many people think we should share the gospel with people? How many people think we should tell other people the good news of Jesus Christ? Okay, I don't think there's too many people in here going, nah, I think you keep that to yourself. No, 
We all say we should share. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hand. How many people struggle with that? You can answer in your heart or give me a little something. Right? We struggle with that. Why do we struggle with that? I believe for one of two reasons. The first one, don't get too upset. Let me get to the second one. The first one, I think we don't share it because we don't have it. Okay? We talked about this several weeks ago. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You've got to be born again. Why is it that we don't see the, the spiritual fruit in people's lives? Because they haven't been born again. All right, so maybe that's you today. Maybe you've never tasted the living water, okay? You can't give away what you don't have. We can give away more religion, right? We can invite people to church, but to actually share the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that people go, I believe it. Listen, we're going to read. This, this woman goes back and tells the people in her town who look down on her, who criticize her. Do they hear her and go, that crazy woman. Who are you to talk about the Messiah? Give me, a, give me a break. We know what you're doing. Do they do that? No, they, they respond. Why? I believe there's something about her testimony. They look and go, hold on, wait. This is a woman that usually hides from us, and she's coming up with boldness, telling us that she thinks she's found the Messiah. Okay? You have to be able to give it away. You have to have it in order to give it away. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I think the reason why we struggle so much is because we we quench the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians 5.19 says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to quench the Holy Spirit? And, and I'm running a risk here of mixing my metaphors a little bit. The word quench means to put out, like put out a fire. Okay? We read last week. I'll read the passage to you really quick. Uh, this is John 7, 37 through 39. It says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. What is living water all about? It's about the Holy Spirit inside of us. Okay, moving inside of us. Now here's the thing. God in his unbelievable compassion for us and his unbelievable desire to give us free will allows us to actually quench him, to suppress him, all right? So we can quench this living water that's within us. Think about it this way. Um, think of a well where, or a spring where water is just flowing, right? And you take a huge boulder and you put it on top and stop that water from flowing. We do that to the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't share, because the Holy Spirit's not moving in us. The word living is, is such a beautiful word. When Jesus says, I would have given you living water, that word means vigorous, full of vigor, active, powerful, okay? You get a picture of this? This isn't a, a stagnant pond that develops in us. This is, this is living water. Jesus actually goes as far as say that it's going to be a spring that comes forth welling up. You picture that? Do you have that going on inside of you? You have a spring just welling up, that's boiling over, that's just flowing inside of you, creating this passion. Is that what's going on inside of your heart? If not, evangelism is going to be hard to do. I'm getting you to do something you're not passionate about. So before I jump into rules saying, hey, here's a great way to share the gospel with people, if you don't have that living water, that water bubbling up inside of you, this is going to be a chore. How many people need help talking about something that you're excited about? Does it take much coaxing to do that? Somebody say Cleveland or Golden State right now, and I'll start talking about the series. You don't have to convince me. You don't have to ask me deep questions. Just start. I will start talking about it. Cleveland's done, just to throw that out there. Just, just going to throw it out there in case you were wondering. Right? Nobody has to convince me of that. No one has to say, come on, man, you're being really quiet about, this, about sports. Tell me about sports. I just talk about it. Why? Because I love it. You're not going to have to convince me to talk about my kids. Matter of fact, you just talk about your kids, and I'm probably going to talk about my kids. Right? Why? Because that's just welling up. That's a spring that's ready to just spew forward. The gospel is the same thing. If I tell you, you ought to share the gospel with people. You can try to get some willpower and say, okay, I'll try to make myself do it. I'll see if I can do it. That's not what it's all about. That's not what this woman does, right? Jesus doesn't say, hold on, wait, wait. Before you go, sit down. I want to tell you, these are the five steps of evangelism. He doesn't do that, Right? What's it say? It says, this woman left her bucket and went. 
How many people think water is important? It's pretty important, even in our day. We take it for granted, we just turn a faucet. This woman had to travel a couple miles to come get water to take back to her town for whatever she was going to do that day. She doesn't take water back, there's nothing to drink. She doesn't take water back, stuff isn't getting cooked. What's she do? Leaves her bucket. Why? Because this woman just, she just experienced something so unbelievable. Who cares about this water? I'm gone. I got to tell somebody. Okay? This is a spring welling up inside of her. Is this what's going on inside of you? If not, what is the answer? Drink that living water. Drink that living water. What does that mean? Who's the living water? Jesus. Taste him. How do we do that? Get into his word. Read the scriptures. Spend some time in prayer. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. This is how we listen for God. This is how we experience Jesus. This is how that well begins to well up inside of you. We start reading the good news of what Jesus did for us. How can we not get excited? Come on, man. I was dead in my sin. Dead. And I was raised to new life. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creature. I can stand before God blameless. You think I care what you think? Seriously, that's your testimony right now. People look at you and say, not him. He's a, who cares? The creator of the whole universe looks at me and says, blameless, my kid. It's my child. That's who we are. How do you not get excited over that? Come on, man. We're going to spend all of eternity with him in heaven. All of eternity. No more tears. You struggling with sickness? That ain't going to last forever. You feeling afraid? You nervous? You anxious? That ain't lasting forever. That's how it's going to be gone. And we're going to spend all of eternity with him in glory. Come on, how can we not get excited about that? It's when we start to taste him and, and experience these things that makes us and compels us to go out and talk about it to other people. Right? When your life has been changed, I mean, can you imagine if you literally, physically died and were raised back to life? Would, you have, would somebody have to coax you into telling that story? You'd probably be telling everybody, I was dead yesterday. Now I'm alive. Right? You'd be telling everybody. Somebody come up to you and say, man, I've, my hand's been hurting. I got some... I was dead and was raised to life. You think God can't handle that hand thing? Right? We've got to taste the living water. We want to share the gospel. We want to take people that desperately need a drink. We want to take them some living water. We better taste it ourselves so that spring comes up within us. Okay? We got it? So that's the first thing. There's two big things I want to talk about today. That's the first one. That's the good news. We're halfway done. We've got to taste the living water so that spring comes up inside of us, that stirs us, that moves us, that compels us to share the good news of what Jesus has done with us. Okay? All right, so that's what this woman does. She says, leaves her water jar. And I love that because there's such symbolism in that, right? She leaves her water jar. She left behind all of that stuff that never satisfied. We're to do the same thing. All of that stuff you've been struggling with, all of those ways that you've been trying to quench your thirst, you get to leave that behind. You get to leave that behind. All your years of struggling for approval of other people, all your years of struggling trying to find the right man for you, all those years of struggling with addiction, all those years of struggling with whatever... We get to leave that behind. Why? Because the Messiah just set me free. Okay? All right, so she leaves her water jar behind, went back to the town, said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? Okay, here's one little, one little helpful tool in, in sharing the gospel with people. Our job is to invite people in. Okay? Do we have the power to save anybody? No. We have to take them to the one who can. Notice she poses this as a question. She says, look, I just met a guy. Come see him. I just met a guy who told me everything I've ever, everything I've ever did. Okay? But then she, what does she say? Could this be the one? What is she doing? She's inviting them in. The question is now their question. They're hearing this and they're going, hmm, could this be the Messiah? Now they start to have their thirst or their appetite start to be tingled a little bit, right? So, so that's what you need to do. Listen, you don't need all the answers. You don't need all the answers. The question is, can you get people asking questions? Like, I, I love it when people say, well, I don't really believe in God because I just don't see how whatever. They've opened the door for conversation. Right? They've opened the door for conversation. You get to ask them, well, what do you believe? Now they're engaged. Okay? Sharing the gospel is not just about giving sta making statements and trying to convince people of something. 
It's about inviting them into your story, what you experienced, okay? It says, they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him. We've got two different stories kind of going on at the same time that's part of the same story, okay? We need to make sure we get that. This is one big story. God has an intention with everything that's going on, but it's taking place in two different places, All right? Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Okay, now where, where did the disciples go? Where were they at while Jesus was having this conversation with this woman? They went into town to get something to eat, right? What town did they go to? Probably Sakar, the one this woman is from. Who lives there? Samaritans. Now, I love this. Jesus takes them into Samaria. These people, the Jews that were following Jesus, would have looked at them and been like, why are we here? Why are we with these people? And what does Jesus do? Send them by themselves into town to get food that they have prepared, that they have, they have harvested, that they have touched. That they... Jesus is forcing them into this area that they don't want to be in. Okay? They come back and find Jesus talking to this woman. The woman leaves, and they say, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? I love that. Right? This is a consistent thing. Jesus says something and people misunderstand it. Why? Because Jesus is constantly using things that we see, everyday things, things in, in the external, physical things, to make spiritual points. Is he talking about real food here? Physical food? No, he's talking about something else. They come back and say, Rabbi, eat something. They're concerned for him. This was a typical thing during this day. This is what a disciple would do. They would take care of their master. They would take care of the one that they were following, their rabbi. So they're taking care of his needs. It's 12 o'clock already. They've traveled several hours, probably in the hot sun. They come back and they say, Jesus, you need to eat something. Surely you're getting hungry. Surely you're getting tired. Sure, certainly you need this nourishment. Eat something. Jesus says, I have food that you know nothing about. I get my nourishment somewhere else. And they say, man, because somebody had brought him something to eat. I love that. Like Jesus is hiding Twinkies in his pocket or something. Could he, could he have something to eat? Jesus smuggling stuff, right? Could he have got something to eat? Where did he get some food from? Then his disciples said to each other, because someone had brought him food. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What is Jesus saying? Listen, the thing that sustains me, the thing that keeps me going, the thing that satisfies my soul isn't just physical food. Did need, Jesus need physical food? Yes. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's trying to teach them a lesson. He says, there's something else that satisfies my soul. There's something else that feeds my soul. And that thing is to do the will of the one who sent me. Is that what satisfies you? Do you long for that kind of nourishment this morning? To do the will of the one who sent you. To do the will of your heavenly father. Verse 35, he says, don't you have a saying? And, and, and I just I love the way Jesus teaches. This, this really gives me freedom to tell stories because that's what Jesus does, right? Jesus looks around and finds examples of things that people see every day and uses them to unlock spiritual realities. So he's talking about this food, right? This nourishment that he has that has nothing to do with physical food, and yet he's going to turn and talk to, about something physical, all right? He says, uh, verse 35, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. This, there's a lot of debate on what this means exactly. I think the best reading is to read this physically and to say, hey, aren't you saying that there's still four months before the barley is harvested? Okay? He says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. This is the second major point that I want us to walk away with today. One, are we drinking from the living water? Okay? And two, are we opening our eyes and looking at the fields? Okay? He says, it's still four months until harvest. He says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. What is Jesus doing? He's at this well and he's looking out over the fields. He says, you see the fields? I know you're looking at them and you're saying, we still got four months before it's time for harvest, but I'm telling you, open your eyes. Is he talking about these eyes? He's talking about our spiritual eyes. Open your eyes and see there's already a harvest waiting. There's already a harvest waiting. It says, even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for, e for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap 
what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Now, this seems like this keeps switching back and forth, right? You're like, hold on, wait. He's talking about the fields. He's talking about a harvest, reaping and sowing. And now the people are coming back. All of this is one story. Jesus is pointing at this field, right? And he's saying it's still four months before the barley is ready for harvest. But I'm telling you, open your eyes and see what's happening at this time. The Samaritans are coming out of the town. They can see them. Jesus is looking, saying, look at the field, ready for harvest. Okay? He's saying, look at the Samaritans that are coming, are ready. I'm bringing you in to reap what has been sowed. What does all this sowing and reaping and all that stuff have to do with? He's talking about planting. He's talking about harvesting. He's talking about seeds. We're going to read later on in other stories that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is described as a seed. He says, look, people have been sowing this seed. They've been planting this seed for years and years and years and years. All of the prophets, Moses, uh, Abraham, all these people have been sowing, preparing this seed. And now you're getting ready to reap it. You're getting ready to reap the benefits of this. Okay? He, he gives the same invitation to us today, right? We're about to, we get to reap the benefits of it. We read about Moses. We read about all these stories in the scriptures that God has given us to start planting seeds. And now is the time to reap. Now is the time to reap the fruits of that. Okay, but the question is, do we, are we willing to open our eyes and look? Are you willing to open your eyes and look around you at who is ready? Who are, who are you supposed to be impacting? Who are you supposed to be, be sharing the gospel with? Are we, are we opening our eyes and looking around? Because listen, the field is ripe. Right? You look outside of here, we look at a, at a town that is ripe that is just waiting for someone to come and share the good news with them, okay? God invites us in in this process. This is what Jesus is saying. I've brought you disciples in on this process. You're going to begin to, to join in the labor. Are we joining in the labor? Are we sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? I was talking with Frank King. I don't think I saw him come in last night. Frank shared with us on Thursday night, and I don't think I'm breaking any confidence in this, um, he was sharing with us that he has a couple of guys that he works with that don't know the Lord, and they're sick. And at this point, it looks like they're going to die relatively soon. And he was expressing that, man, I'm, just, I'm concerned for these guys, and I feel like the Lord is telling me, share the good news. Talk to them about me. And he was like, I just I don't know that I can. I don't know that I, I just don't feel, I don't feel adequate. I don't feel good enough. I don't feel all of these kinds of things. You know, and we prayed for him and we talked about him being bold and courageous to the point that he, he texted me last night and he said, hey, I shared Jesus with one of these guys. He said, but he said it ended up the exact way that I thought it would. The guy, I guess, rejected it, didn't want to hear it, all that kind of stuff. I said, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. What did Jesus say? Some sow, some reap. Right? In many cases, we get to reap what God is already sowing in people's lives. But guess what? Sometimes he calls us to sow seed. So don't be frustrated. We have no idea what God does with our obedience. None. Maybe his job was to plant the seed in this guy, and someone else will reap the harvest. Are we reaping? Are we sowing? Are we investing in people? Are we joining in the labor of Jesus to help people to come in a relationship with him? Like this is something we, we have to want to do it. We have to open our eyes and see in order to be a part of it. Who is it right now when you close your eyes and you think? Who, is, who, who comes into your head? Who are the people that God has put in your presence? Is it a family member? Is it a coworker? Is it a neighbor? Who is it that comes to your head? Listen, that's not an accident. It's not an accident. It's not an accident that, the, that you live next to them. It's not an accident that you work with them. It's not an accident that you're hearing this message this morning. God, I believe, wants to fill us to overflowing this morning, knowing that he is good, knowing that he is the living water so that we will leave and take cups of water to the people he has surrounded us with. The question becomes, are we, are we going to be obedient and do it? Are we going to trust him that he will give us the words to say? 
As I was listening to Frank talk the other night, that was one of the things that kept running through my mind over and over and over and over. Jesus says, hey, look, don't stress about what you're going to say. I'll give you the words. Do we trust him in that? Do we trust that God's going to be faithful with the seed that he gives you to plant? Are you going to be obedient in that? Look, there is a world out there that is ripe for the harvest. The problem is the workers are few. Are you a worker? Are you a worker? Are you going to join in the labor of Christ to take glasses of living water to people who are desperately thirsty for it? Let's pray. Father, I pray that um, I pray that you would give us these images in our head of the loved ones that we have, of the co-workers that we have, of the people that you have surrounded us with. I pray that we can't shake those images. I pray that every single person who's sitting in here right now, you would put this desire, this passion, this burden on them to share the good news with the people that you have put around them. Father, just fill us to overflowing, first and foremost, for those that are here who haven't tasted the living water. I pray that this very second, they would reach out to you, that they would take what you are offering them, that they would take this living water, that we would be like this Samaritan woman who's willing to drink of that water and leave everything else behind. Give us that kind of passion in our hearts, Lord, for you, first and foremost, and for other people. Or when we start talking about the need in this country, the need that people have, when we look around and we see the hurt, the brokenness, when we see people just dying of thirst and dying of starvation, and I don't mean physically, I mean spiritually, help us to understand that you have given us the water and the food that these people need. Help us, Lord, to be like this Samaritan woman to follow her lead and share the good news of what you have done for us with them. Because, Father, we, we want to join you in the labor. We want to be workers. We want to hear someday, well done, good and faithful servant. So, Father, once again, we just want to thank you. We love you. We thank you for what you've done in us. Pray that you would continue to just pour into us. I pray that you would not allow us to quench your spirit as you want to lead us and guide us and empower us to do all of these things. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.